you. Well, thank you, and thank you, Elaine. Thank you all for being here. Is this a great bookstore, or what? <laughs>
of honoring her because I feel that you know we're not only here to sell her book and have a luncheon and get acquainted and all those sorts of things, but the book that I've written is all about how we need to honor our friends, among other things, how we need to honor life, how we need to honor what is best in ourselves. And friendship, and friendships like we have are rather rare. Um, and it's true that I, I, like I told Elaine, I would do anything for her. They called me, I even slept over to Berkeley because they had an evening honoring Rita over there. So if, if I can say to you, Rita, if they're gonna honor you anywhere, New York, Los Angeles, I mean, now that you're the story of the week and you have all of this, what we call Yiddish COVID, this recognition, um, I'll be there. Just make sure that John takes care of the plane ticket, but I will be there. <laughs> Do you, uh, do you need a per diem? <laughs> you know there's nothing I wouldn't do for you, and we are so pleased, I think I'm speaking for everybody in this room, to have you here, to honor you, to hear you speak. Please give a warm and generous welcome to one of the most generous people I know, Rita Moran. You know, no one ever gets to know about the lady at his side over there. And at the very least, I want to acknowledge Leslie, his spectacular wife. Let's get it. today is read one of my favorite um, funny uh, parts of the book because uh, it just tells you a great deal. It covers a lot of ground uh, and it is about the time uh, when I was told by MGM Studios, the studio who had signed me as a young starlet to be with them for the next seven years. <laughs> right. Uh, one of the things that the studios did at the time with their young players was to send them out on assignments, as it were. Uh, uh, they would send you to veterans' hospitals. They would send you to all kinds of places to just say hello. And mostly, really, from their standpoint, to make your face known among people who had no idea who you were, but that you were tied with MGM, and that was a good thing. And MGM was a huge, huge, important, powerful studio in those days. So uh, somewhere in my um, first year at MGM Studios, when I had done one film with a man named Mario Lanza, um, oh, there's some old farts here. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Uh, he was the Andrea Bocelli. Time. Uh, I was sent to a hospital with uh, Anne, and there's a very famous, Anne Miller. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I know who I'm talking about. I had two glasses of wine. <laughs> uh, and we visited veterans. I had no idea how to talk to these young men. It was kind of scary. And Anne <laughs> was very famous for having said, now I really want you to laugh at this. <laughs> and without any mean thought in her mind, said to a young uh, uh, amputee who had lost his legs, Well, honey, I gotta go and say hello to other people, so better luck next time. <laughs> She really meant well. <laughs> she did. And by the way, she called people honey because she didn't want to think about what their names were. So she never knew anybody's name. I mean, many years later, way after I had met her and been with her for a bunch of times, she finally was able to call me <coughs> honey. So here's what happened to me. I was sent by MGM, as was she, to be eye candy for an opening of a very uh, fancy, 
a Palm Beach Hotel, which by the way still exists, it's called The Colony. And the uh, hotel also had a little colony club, which still exists, where they have wonderful singers, cabaret singers, all the time. So um, Anne and I were sent as a team to help decorate this, this big fancy opening with society people, mostly society people. There were a number of stars who were sent for the same purposes by other studios. And there I found myself, there was Rosita Dolores Alverio sitting opposite the great Ann Miller and hopelessly, completely tongue-tied. What do you see, your personal icon? You know, I'm a dancer too. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I admired your dancing all my life. Oh, that's nice, honey. <laughs> what kind of dance? Well, it's Spanish dance. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's flamenco, uh, it's the Sevillanas, pronounced Sevillanas. Sevillat? Sevillatnas? Oh, wait a minute, I got it, I got it. You mean like uh, sambas and tangos and romans, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's kind of it. So anyway, I just want you to know that I just love it so much. When I seen you dance on all those platforms and steps, big flights of steps and stuff, I mean, it's really scary. And boy, I just don't know. I just don't know how you did it. How do you do it? Listen, honey. What's your name? Rita. Well, let me tell you something, honey. If I have to do one more, if I have to do one more fucking dance, <laughs> on one more fucking platform, one more fucking strangle that fucking choreographer. <laughs> now, every time my idol dropped the old death bomb, my head literally snapped back with each utterance. I gasped, but did not wish to appear critical. I mean, after all, on that mission, Anne Miller was the headliner. <clears throat> I was only eye candy. At that time, by the way, Palm Beach was a seriously big time society place with very wealthy gentlemen, mostly scions, and bejeweled, coiffed, bay paley types. I believe that Palm Beach is still in that time, having been placed in suspended animation around 1953. <laughs> Quaffed, in this case, meant a very smooth jaw length, barely there page boy with a side part. Even then, Palm Beach women were skeleton thin, which author Tom Wolfe would later dub in his novel Bonfire of the Vanities, The X-Rays. <laughs> this made me question the Duchess of Windsor's old saying, one can never be too rich or too thin. Palm Beach women seem to be both. The Palm Beach women fell into two categories. The old heiresses, who resembled the horses they rode, <laughs> and younger trophy wives. The prettiest and youngest of the trophy wives I met on that weekend was an instant favorite of mine, Greg Dodge otherwise known as Mrs. Horace Dodge, Jr. She was an expensive bottle blonde whom I had last seen performing at the Copacabana as a showgirl in New York City. Gray had become the fifth wife of the Dodge Auto heir at the first moment that she noticed a breast droop. <laughs> Smart move. As the wealth seemed limitless. As it turned out, Greg would hit that limit, but it did take her some time to achieve bankruptcy. When I met her that weekend, she was in her glory. Gorgeous and rich, sexy, and so very rich. And still a happy-go-lucky gal, a Texan gal who wanted to show it off and share her good fortune. When Greg invited me to her mansion on the main mansion drag, Ocean Drive, it was obvious that she had scored wealth beyond anything. I had ever glimpsed. As she led me up to her bedroom, I noted that Greg was even leggier than Ann Miller. I would have loved to see them on a kickoff. <laughs> she couldn't wait. I, I, oh, yes. We were already deep in girl talk, and I gushed, you know, 
I just thought you were the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in the show in my life when I saw you strike a pose. And I meant it. I also complimented Greg on her gleaming cheeks. She couldn't wait to pass along her secret. Vaseline, honey. <laughs> but to apply it very, very thin, sweetie. This was an old showgirl trick. We walked through what seemed to be a series of walk-in closets. If memory serves, an entire floor of the mansion was, was a walk-in closet. <laughs> Finally, Greg said, come on over to my fog closet, and I'll lend you some of my stoles. Oh my god, I thought as we walked into a vast cooler. In, is this what heaven is like? I thought, heaven in the Arctic. <laughs> the closet was filled with forlorn dead creatures which didn't bother me in the least at that time. <laughs> Greg chose a silvery blue mink stole and stooped to drape it over my shoulders. I felt like kneeling as if this were a coronation. <laughs> I walked on air for the rest of the week feeling very complete. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Greg Dodge went on to live a long, expensive life. I suppose you could say she spent her later years. So she spent every cent of Dodge's money. <clears throat> Dodge decided to divorce her at one point, crying, I can't afford this woman anymore. <laughs> he dropped dead after the divorce was final, but Horace had cut her out of his will, and besides, he didn't have any money left. Thanks to Greg's talent for spending. Anyway, Greg spent all of that money. Finally, she married her bodyguard. <laughs> 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 and spent his money. He shot himself in the head. She went on to live a long life, dying at age 87, but she died in reduced circumstances. <laughs> the most important <laughs> event of that publicity weekend, and this is the meat of this anecdote, was the official opening of the Colony Hotel. This took place at the in-house nightclub, the Royal Room, which still functions and books many cabaret artists. The place was jammed with socialites, horsey <coughs> folk, and famous people of every stripe. The person I remember most vividly from that event was Anita Ekberg, the <laughs> Swedish American model, actress, and pinup girl. Anita, a lush Nordic beauty, was at the height of her fame and caused a stir every time she brandished those. Brandish those exceptional girls <laughs> her giant breasts. And brandish them she did, causing much alarm or joy, depending on your gender. <laughs> <laughs> Anita made all the papers the next day because she, most likely in her substantial cups, pun intended, decided to grace the waters of the Atlantic Ocean with her voluptuous self. Well. The word got around instantly. I mean, isn't that what press agents are for? <laughs> and at least three quarters of the populace of the Royal Room raced out to see on the beach what was going on. It looked like the club was vomiting people <laughs> as out they scurried all these society folk. The ladies got sand in their golden sandals and hopped about on one foot to take them off looking for all the world like crazed marionettes in their hurry to see the spectacle, the spectacle. And what a night it was. Anita emerged from the sea like Venus rising above the frothy waves, minus the clamshell. <laughs> Strapless chiffon clinging like saran wrap. She truly showed the world and us, mere mortals, what God can achieve. <laughs> on a good day. <laughs> but all good things have to come to an end. The goddess, walking along the sand, fell down a oh, <laughs> splat, right down on her ample derriere, ass over tea kettle, glocken over spiel, and legs splayed, one still airborne in her goddess tunic slowly crept up to her knickers. And the final insult, her tiara cocked over one eye. <laughs> Showtime was over. And that rude fickle audience sauntered back to the club looking forward to more booze and buzz. Now, I was sitting with Adam close to that door that led to the beach, watching the sandy crowd crunch their way back to the tables when I spotted a very 
handsome, red-headed gentleman in for <coughs> full formal gear. He was accompanying a lovely, <coughs> regal woman wearing the gown of the moment. I had seen that dress in Vogue magazine that very day. A silk taffeta print with large red roses on a full gathered skirt. It was gorgeous. It was the first time I'd ever seen a woman wearing white opera gloves. In other words, a lady. As this couple slowly walked in, sauntering as though to catch everyone's attention, the gentleman in question caught my eye with an expression on his handsome face that was unmistakable. His hairline moved back an inch, <laughs> as when a predatory animal spots his prey and paralyzes it with <laughs> that look. <laughs> it was obviously lust at first sight. And I remember thinking, ooh, this guy don't waste no time. <laughs> All of this happened in the wink of an eye while his white glove companion in the beautiful dress <clears throat> was busy trading hellos with friends. To me, though, their possession was taking place in slow motion as they reached their destination at the opposite end of the room. They were gorgeous. For the rest of the evening, I played a private little game that I called Izzy's. Because every time I looked this man's way, I would catch him sendering, sending me smoldering signals. They were so obvious and so shameless that I actually started to laugh. Whenever I caught him staring at me, I would point my finger at him as if to say, gotcha. <laughs> he didn't even blink. Ooh. I'm surprised that no one else noticed our game, but they were too busy looking at this beautiful couple. I was also stunned that a man with such a perfect woman at his side could be even remotely interested in the likes of me. At one point, I asked Anne to take a look to see if she could identify him. Oh, honey, who the hell knows, she said. You all look the same to me. Rich. Rich. <laughs> I wanted to add, I want to add that I sent the most subtle, I had I sent the most subtle, I am interested, signals. <coughs> I have no doubt this man <coughs> would have sent someone over to my table to escort me upstairs. I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever. Imagine my shock weeks later when the red-headed man who had flirted so boldly with me reappeared on the cover of Life magazine and I discovered who he was. The young senator from Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> there was a show that night, but this is long, but I hope you can enjoy it. <laughs> Well, that's my take on it. <laughs> there was a show that night with an upcoming comic who probably wanted to slit his throat after his stint because nobody but nobody, nobody paid the least attention to him except Anne and me. The first rule of thumb in my profession is to never, never, never perform for high society. <laughs> they will murder you. They will destroy your will to live through your toxic inattention. <laughs> After that debacle in the royal room, we were all invited to attend, to attend a reception at one of the Toppings Brothers' mansions. They were very rich guys. So on the lawn, I ensconced myself on a carved stone Victorian bench and just decided to stay there, the lawn which was really the backyard, because that's where the yachts were parked. <laughs> Excuse me, more. At one point, Anne, so Anne also convinced me that we should go on an exploratory mission to look inside all of the medicine cabinets. <laughs> I did investigate a few medicine cabinets with her, but got cold feet. Afterwards, I saw a year's worth of condoms in one. <clears throat> a year's, are you listening? A year's <laughs> Yes, the entire bloody cabinet. I fled the house at that point, fearful that the owner reprobate would somehow find me in there and haul me off to one of those endless bedrooms to give me what for with his bottomless supply of good years. <laughs> so I returned back to outside. 
Finally, Anne came outside again, looking breathless and wide-eyed, so breathless and wide-eyed that I asked, did somebody catch her? She said, oh my God, honey, look at those mini mouse eyes as big as plates. You will not believe this. Well, I had already finished with the cabinets and walked out the hall when I heard some thuds coming from behind a closed door. I opened it, and would you believe it? Pressed against the bookcase was a woman with a skirt over her head, with a man leaning into her with his pants around his ankles, doing it! <laughs> Anne was shrieking by now, so I was grateful for the band playing the goodnight song, wishing we'll make it so. <laughs> and she told me in detail about the amorous couple, couple having a major go at doing it. Well, see, there were a number of books, some open, that must have tumbled from the force of the action laying all over the floor. <laughs> well, you know, that makes sense, right? I mean, when you've got a skirt over your head and you don't have a clue where you're being pushed, things will fall off the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do? I was completely caught up in the story picturing the whole scene. I didn't know what to do. So I just kept saying, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh my, oh my, oh my. Have you any idea? how complicated it is to pull up your undies with a skirt over your head. <laughs> well, better than showing your face. Here's more, that's it. <laughs> and needless to say, that Hollywood part is only a very, very small part of it. <laughs> it's really largely about uh, someone coming from another country and trying to find a self. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, what do I do now? What do you do? <laughs> you want to answer some questions for me? Oh, I would love that. I'm going to bring the mic over here. Okay. So you can sit down yeah. and answer some questions. And uh, maybe we can bring some you so we can get some really good answers. That was wonderful. Thank you, Rita, for that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm from New York, and uh, my husband was a Jew, and I had a lot of Jewish friends, so I always sound like that. <laughs> yes? Well, what happened with JFK? What happened with JFK? Nothing! <laughs> oh, I know. You wanted me to shook him, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> no! Yeah. That's not nice. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that was, that's not nice at all. I would never have done that. But I have to tell you, I, I don't even know if I, I've described it correctly enough or colorfully enough in the book, he really was making obscene eyes at me. Yeah. It was really, I've never seen anyone go, I don't know if you can see this, I don't know where you are. God, that's a low chair. <laughs> it was like, And it makes perfect sense now, because it, when I when I saw that him on the life of the cover of Life, I thought, oh, I can't believe that's the guy. Because I said to my roommate, that's the guy I was talking to you about. Rita, no, I did not do it with him. Okay, that's what Rita, forgive me. He didn't miss much. He had Addison's disease, and he only was a two-minute man. Oh. <laughs> For those who didn't hear it, Michael said he was a he had Addison's disease. And he was a two-minute man. Mm -hmm. You know what? I was so inexperienced. Would I have known? <laughs> Probably what I would be thinking is, oh, that's what they're all carrying on about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He could have had me. He could have had you? <laughs> well, you are, you are a celebrity slut. That's all I know. Attracted to, and I hear you're attracted to almost anyone when you're working with them, but I'd love to hear a little more about you. No, I wasn't attracted to just anyone when I was doing the film. Where'd you get that idea? <laughs> Did you read the book? <laughs> no, of course not. How dare you? No, there was there, there were there are a few juicy parts of the book, and I I like to think that they are they are judiciously uh, chosen, and. Um, there was Anthony Quinn, who was, you know, one of my heroes because he was a Latino and he was a gorgeous looking man, but 
you know, it all happened so fast. And what did I say in the book? I got, uh, what was that called? Whiplash. Whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not Joan Rivers. <laughs> and it's really not what this book is about. And I didn't want it to be, I thought it would be interesting to hear about some of these people. But um, essentially, as I said earlier, it's really about this, this uh, young woman who comes from another country and tries very hard not to be herself because she, she finds that being herself is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, being called spick and garlic mouth and pierced ear. Mm -hmm. That happened when I was five. I didn't even know what they were saying. I just knew that because of the way in which they said it, it was not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <coughs> yes, please stand up, it helps. When did you finally feel that you were yourself? When did I finally feel, it took me, that I was myself, I'm repeating a question. It took a very long time. It took uh, some kind of proof, outside proof, and it happened in West Side Story, which is a long time, really, when you think of how long I was in Hollywood. But um, I'll tell you the most wonderful story, and I believe I put this in the book. <clears throat> when I say I believe, it's just that I'm 81, sometimes I don't remember. I think I put it in the book. The night that the Oscars took place, the West <coughs> Side Story was going to be honored. And of course it was, it won every award in the book. Every book, every record at that time, until Titanic came along. <laughs> Can somebody explain that to me? Okay, I'm not gonna wait for an answer. Anyway, that night, you know what, let me sit where everyone can see me back there. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, good, okay. Uh, that night, a girlfriend of mine who was a Hispanic comedian named Liz Torres. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's a wonderful comedian. And who loved me, and whom I loved very much. We had a bond. There were so few of us around for a long time. She told me the best story about Oscar night. She said, well, first of all, let me explain that until Oscar night, until the night I won the Oscar, I never had much communication with the Hispanic community, essentially because the Hispanic community doesn't have a history of writing fat mail. <clears throat> they just, it's not something that's done. I mean, they may do it now, but it's probably the younger people. It certainly wasn't the older people. So I never had a real connection. And it made me very sad, actually, but I didn't know what to do about it. So, uh, as you may know, the ghetto, the Hispanic ghetto, is a very noisy place. I am noisy. I am raucous. We are rather raucous people. We are. We cry loud. We laugh loud. And but at the moment, all the windows were open because it was summertime. And at the moment that my name was being announced, along with all the other nominees, Rock Hudson was announcing them. That place became dead silent, which is almost unimaginable. Mm -hmm. And when he finally announced my name as the winner, those people, Liz told me, went crazy. Mm -hmm. They started screaming out the windows, she did it, she did it. And they were just, I mean, truly jubilating. They were so happy. And as Tony Dacconi said to me, the man who did my play, uh, Life Without Makeup, yeah. at Berkeley Red, um, he said, you know what they were really saying? They were saying, Shh, we did it. We did it. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, when she told me that story, I just burst into tears because I had never until then had a real connection with my community. And uh, of course, it remains to this very moment. But, uh, Oh, nice story. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, lots of yes, sir. Many of us remember you with great affection for the West Side Story, but I'm, I understand that you really were not a dancer before you became the star on the West Side Story. Can you tell us about that? Okay. <coughs> this gentleman is saying that I became known for my dancing in West Side Story, but as he understands it, I was never a dancer before that. No, that's not so. I was a Spanish dancer. I did a lot of flamenco, 
and uh, cast a network and all that kind of stuff, but I had never done, which is more important and more meaningful, the kind of dancing that we did in West Side Story, which is now called jazz. You know, some of us might call it modern dancing, but it's totally different. And when I auditioned for West Side Story, I ensconced myself in a dancing school for months trying to catch up because at that point I hadn't danced in, I don't know, about 10 years. It's ridiculous. I should not have been able to win that audition. But I did something rather sly. Uh, you know, when you want something, I called a girlfriend of mine who had done played Anita on the road in West Side Story, the play. And she knew all the moves. And I said, can you teach me something that they might teach me in the audition from the dance things? And she said, sure. She said, but I have to make you understand that uh, you won't necessarily get the moves I'm going to give you. Are you coming to me? You can go pee pee. <laughs> Fix your wagon, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, I wish you could come and ask me something. Or kiss my shoes or something. <laughs> anyway, she taught me some steps from America and some steps from the dance at the gym where they were all competing. And she said, but I can't guarantee that those are the steps that they're going to teach you in the audition because auditions for dance are very different. If you have a singing audition, you sing your own songs and it's fine. An acting audition, you do a scene from the play and that's it. So I went to the audition with my heart in my throat and uh, interestingly enough, the uh, assistant dance director taught me something from America that she had taught me. And taught me something from uh, the dance of the gym that she had taught me. And Jerry Robbins, I found out much later, um, was very anxious to know what happened. And he said, Please tell me that she's good, because I really want her for this. And the guy said, well, his assistant said, well, it's obvious she hasn't danced in a while. <laughs> and he said, we're going to have to kind of beat it out of her. But he said, she's vivacious, she has style, she has energy, and I think we can do it. That's, but he said, but the most amazing thing about her, <laughs> she learned so fast. <laughs> You do what you got to do, right? Yes. Um, would you talk a little, please, about your mother and about her role and you two coming? Talk about my mom. She was extraordinary in a way. This book could have been about my mother because she's the one who gave birth to me when she was about 17. And uh, she was married in Puerto Rico. And uh, she decided that life would be a lot better for her in another country, the U.S. And um, she divorced my father, which was extraordinary in that little Catholic island at that time. She took a ship to New York City, <coughs> stayed in an aunt's uh, titi, titi uh, apartment, which had three other uh, families in it and four bedrooms. And she got a job sewing in sweatshops because most Puerto Rican women at that time particularly knew how to sew rather well, as a matter of fact. She embroidered too, she was fabulous. When she made enough money and uh, learned enough English, she went back to Puerto Rico to retreat me. I didn't recognize her. Uh, I mean, all of this is, is in the book. And she was very wise. She brought a trunk full of, it looked like a trunk full of toys and clothing because she sewed so beautifully. She made lots of beautiful little dresses for me and chose me to come with her to the United States. But if you've read the book, as you may know, she left my little brother Francisco behind and uh, I never saw him again. No, no we, couldn't, we couldn't find him. Life is tough, so you just go on and you move on. But that's my mom. She was extraordinary. She was uneducated. She was charming. She was sexy, she was cute, and she was not a good parent. But you know, that's not unusual, is it? I mean, she loved her daughter. She sure loved her daughter. 
So what can I say? You're back. Come on, sit down. <laughs> Come on, sit down. <laughs> yes. Of all the roles I've done, of all the media, and all the media. Well, in all the media includes theater, right? So I played Maria Callas in Masterclass here at the Berkeley Rep, wow. which I just loved. And I also played Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard Ooh. in London, which was spectacular. And, and then, of course, is Anita in West Side Story. But uh, there have been some, um, you know, it's interesting. For a person who hasn't done that many films, I've done some extraordinary classics. Singing in the Rain is one. Uh, Carnal Knowledge is another, which is an extraordinary movie, if you can stomach it. Yeah. Uh, a movie that was way ahead of its time. Four Seasons. What? Four Seasons? Oh, Four Seasons! <laughs> Four Seasons with Alan Alden and Carol Burnett is one of my favorites. Yeah. It's, I call it my Christmas uh, video because I play it every Christmas and I laugh at myself like I'd never seen it. <laughs> I was like, no, oh, that's right. Somebody had their hand up there, no? Yeah. What about the Ritz? Oh, I love the Ritz. Anybody know the Ritz here? Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus, that's so depressing. <laughs> okay, so the Ritz was based on something I did in front of a um, in front of a, uh, a playwright named Terence McNally mm -hmm. at a party where I played this crazy character I had invented. And she didn't have a name at the time, but in the movie she got named Gookie Gomez. But she has enormous ambitions, and she's Hispanic. She has the world's thickest uh, Hispanic accent that ever happened. And, but she has very good taste in music, so I see somebody going like this, oh, the pain of it. She's, I, I love her. She's so funny, because she thinks she is God's gift. <laughs> and because Barbara Streisand stole my act. <laughs> Don't mean, don't mean that I'm not brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> she sings. <laughs> Terrence McNally just like, I had a dream. <laughs> a dream about your baby. <laughs> it's going on through, baby. <laughs> they think that we're through, but. And then on the butt, the weight goes back about an inch. <laughs> It's very funny. It is a film, and you can you can find that somewhere. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Yes. Is there anything in the works for us to be able to see you like at first? Anything in the works? I'm going to be doing my uh, cabaret show, my concert at the Napa Opera House in uh, I think it's uh, is it August? August the 17th. Thank you, because I never know anything like that. That's why you have a business manager. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be doing my act there. You might want to come. There's some good songs. Yes. I like at the beginning of your book how you describe leaving Puerto Rico, and you're talking about the colors, and you're talking about the smells. Yeah. I thought that was beautiful. But I'd like to know what your daughter is doing. It seems like you have a really close relationship. My daughter, Fernanda Luisa, is my chum. She has always been. We've been very close from the time that little girl was born, and uh, she makes jewelry. And if you, if you wish to see her website, I'll write it for you here. I'm not going to do it now because that would really be insulting. <laughs> Therefore, if you want to, uh, I'll give you the uh, the website. Um, she still dances now and then. She has two boys, the loves of my life, Justin, who's 14 and Cameron, who's 13. Cameron is a big-time fun guy aficionado. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I love those kids with my heart. And uh, they have a room in my house. When we built a house in Berkeley, they have their own room with special paintings and toys and all kinds of stuff because that's how I feel. I love having family. Maybe because I didn't have any very likely. <coughs> but uh, yes, yes. What about Marlon? What about what? Marlon? Marlon. Marlon. <laughs> Marlon? Yeah, tell me. Ask I, said, I haven't read your book yet. I'm sorry. Wait till you read it. 
because I know from the time when Marlon was it. You come from a time, I'm just repeating so the black people can hear you. You come from a time when Marlon was it. Marlon was it, it you know? yeah. And uh, for me, it was someone so oh, out of this world. And then, you to know, quote her, he was someone who was so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just say read the goddamn book. <laughs> But I don't want to leave you completely bereft. <laughs> Therefore, I can only say that, um, uh, wow, what do you say about Brando in a few words? He was very complex. He was um, one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. And humor to me means a great deal. I think one of the reasons, one of the reasons I married my husband, Leonard Gordon, is because he was so witty. Wit to me always, oh, here's something interesting you might find about me, because I didn't, it didn't get into the book, even though I wrote a piece on it. I love Jewish men for a very specific reason. I love them because they have a wonderful defense system. Very often, it's about humor. And I've, I've always felt that if, uh, actually, I wrote a very funny chapter on that. Why did they take it out? <laughs> well, you know, the Puerto Ricans over there sell our bra. Um, <laughs> two people laughed real loud. Um, they have a marvelous way of dealing with adversity. And when you are a person like myself, as I have been for many years, not right now, but many, many years, you want a man in your life who you feel whether it's true or not is beside the point, whom you feel can take care of you. And I think Jewish men are really good at that. It was not conscious, but it was very much there. It had a huge presence. And I think that what saves a lot of people's lives in some ways is humor. I mean, Mel Brooks, that was great. the chapter I wrote. Mel Brooks is not gorgeous, but I would have married him in the blink of an eye. <laughs> because I felt he could take care of me. And to, to me, being taken care of is being taken care of by someone who has their wits about them. It happens to be with the Jews, in my mind, wit. Did that explain anything? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes? That's interesting you say it didn't seem like some of my, myself would do that. On the contrary, I had a little girl, and we used to work. Oh, wait a minute, did you get the question? No. OK, she wanted to know why I got involved with the electric company on PBS, the show that helped to teach children to read. Um, uh, when I had Fernanda, we started to watch Sesame Street, which was brilliant. Still is. And uh, when they asked me to do a reading show, I was absolutely ready for it. I was discouraged to do it by many people in my business because uh, they were afraid on my behalf that I would never get to do play an adult again. And I said, but I am playing an adult in this. And uh, it was one of the happiest experiences of my life. I took my daughter to the set all the time. She met Bill Cosby. She met Big Bird. <laughs> I have a picture of her with her little girlfriend, a little black girlfriend with his wings over both of them. Oh, oh. I mean, come on. That's not very terrific. Yeah. That's OK. Are we done? I mean, I don't want, I think, I don't want to stretch this. Yes, I, I love We're that. done. Not, no, you have to sign all these books. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is so fabulous. And you're so generous. And I, it, we all feel that we're your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even and the people who haven't read the book yet, wait till you read it. Yeah. And the cool thing is, everyone here has at least one book, and some people have several because they're thinking about all the other people who need it. So we're going to sign them, and we're going to start uh, with this table right here, and then we'll take these two tables, and then we'll get the other tables. And that way, if you want to sit for a little while while the first three tables are being signed, you don't have to stand in line. And uh, thank you all for being part of this. Thank you.